welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm Dame Lillian Walker, your host, and we are in Chapter 12, and we are going to be discussing the pineal gland. So let's get started with the reading. Get your books open and ready. The pineal gland. So as you know now, when we, as a consciousness, move beyond the world of the senses in this three dimensional reality, we can tap into frequencies that carry specific information beyond the vibration of matter and the speed of light. So when this happens, the brain processes extremely high amplitudes of energy time and time again. Time and time again, we've measured and observed this phenomena in our advanced students' brain scans. So you've also learned that when there is an increase in energy, in the brain, there will always be an increase in consciousness and awareness and vice versa. I'm going to pause here. Let's read this again because this is another distinction. So you've also learned that when there is an increase in energy in the brain, there will always be an increase in consciousness and awareness and vice versa. So if you're wondering, oh gosh, how do I increase my consciousness? How do I increase my awareness? All you have to do is get heart and brain coherence. And like it says here, you've also learned that when there is an increase in energy in the brain, so the moment you decide to unlock the energy from your first, your second, your third energy center, you've decided that you're going to slow down your heart rate, you're going to open your heart, you're going to feel that feeling. It's an elevated emotion you're feeling love as it continues to travel the it being the energy continues to travel up it's gonna as soon as you open your heart forget it you don't even have to intend it, it automatically the energy will flow up to your fifth energy center and it'll go to your brain therefore hitting your pineal gland and that will automatically increase your consciousness and your awareness isn't that great news it's not that complicated it's easy peasy, it's simple. In fact, it is very difficult to determine whether it is the energy of the level of consciousness that causes these extreme measurements. But I don't think we can separate the two because you cannot have a change in energy without a change in consciousness or a change in frequency without a change in information. So as you connect to deeper levels, of the unified field, the brain is activated by a greater energy that carries specific information in the form of thoughts and imagery. So the brain then literally tracks and records this profound inner event to the person having the experience, whatever is happening in their mind seems more real than any past external event. In that moment, the increased energy in the form of a profoundly powerful emotion captures all the mind's attention. This is the instant the brain and the body receive a biological upgrade. I'm going to pause right here. I have talked to you guys about not only, you know, my, my, I've had multiple mystical experiences, but I think the only one that I have actually recorded a YouTube video, which originally was a Facebook Live just to the fellow advanced students within my group that we all were meditating on March 22nd to raise the vibrational frequency, not only of ourselves, but um, of each other so that the rest of the planet entrains with us. You know, there's about 16,000 advanced students who have actually attended Dr. Joe's monasteries. And then there's probably I think there's like 30,000 if you include those who are students who are actively studying and doing some of the online courses, but who haven't been to any of his advanced, seven day advanced at any of his monasteries. That's a fair number of people. That's the size of a city, 30,000 people. You get 30,000 people across over 100 countries. We have 198 countries total on the globe and you have over a hundred countries represented, you know, students from all over the globe that are doing this work it's going to affect it's going to, it's just a matter of time before everyone is affected by this vibrational frequency so all that to say is that as we're talking about this 
not only my own experience, but I also from having been in the monastery, one of the things that I've witnessed time and time again is that when people have these profound mystical experiences, yes, you do receive an, a biological upgrade. You do have the actual experience that is mystical in and of itself, that you, you go someplace, you don't have any idea where it is that you're going to. You know that you're no longer in the room. You know that you're gone. And it's a pretty cool feeling because you are, you're like gone and you know you've gone far, but where, where you go, unless you're told, like I happen to have been told, from my mystical experience on March 22nd, I was actually told where I was, but in all my previous experiences, I've never been informed of, of where I was. I just knew that I was someplace else. I had no idea where I was, nor did I really care where I was. I just knew that I, I went somewhere and now I was in a different plane of existence. So that being said, because you are receiving a biological upgrade at the same time, you're unaware that you're going through a biological upgrade, I think for the most part. However, one of the things that I have noticed from having been, you know, we, there's a thousand of us that are in this room, in this monastery, and some people, uh, you, when you return, you know, cause you're, you're still, think about it, you know, we've studied, in the book, we've learned that as you do these meditations, you are no longer matter to matter. You don't have a dense body. You have actually fanned out and expanded your electromagnetic field, heal your, <laughs> your electromagnetic field. More evidence that I am not perfect and you don't have to be perfect to do this work. Okay, anyhow, you are expanding your electromagnetic field and you are not as dense you are not all matter to matter now because you're not in that fight or flight response anymore you're not as dense so you are more wave energy form and your energy is now expanded out and you are actually lighter lighter in the sense that you're not as dense because there's more energy waves and you're in 5d but also lighter as in you actually have more light. The photons from the tip of your toes all the way to the top of your head to whatever hair is sticking out farthest from your body, including your electromagnetic field is all lit up. Every single cell in your body is emitting a far greater degree of light when you come back from a mystical experience now i can't say for everybody but what i noticed not only for myself because you're kind of in a different transy in betweenish twilighty kind of a state when you come back from a mystical experience and some of the people i have seen where they come back and you can tell that their souls are not fully back in their body and so they need to get grounded again. So we actually have, we have people that are, that spot the people. It's really obvious when somebody is, has come back and they're trying to kind of get, you know, cause you're kind of a little bit dazed. It doesn't feel bad by the way. So you're kind of in a, it's a very unusual, hard to describe, you know, feeling, but some people have a little trouble adjusting coming back. I would venture to say nobody wants to be in a hurry to come back. And the reason why that is, in my experience, is that you, when you have those mystical experiences, you have such a profound sense of love, of joy, of bliss, of ecstasy. It's, it's almost euphoric. Maybe it is a form of euphoria, but I remember actually having the thoughts as I'm having these these harmonic conversations that were going on with all these beings all at the same time I was thinking oh my gosh you know this is the most incredible amount of love I have ever felt in my entire life I mean there couldn't possibly be anything greater than this this is just so it's like oh you just want to sit there and bask in that glorious 
experience. It's a feeling and an experience. And so, and in my case, I, with that particular experience, I went from the sixth dimension and I went into the seventh dimension. And just when I thought I couldn't feel any more love, any more bliss, any more just extraordinary um, supernaturalness, then I felt even more, which just, it just blew my mind to smithereens. And it was just, it's a very undescribable way of describing it. So as far as what I've witnessed with other people, when they come back, they come back and a lot of them can't even talk. A lot of them can't even talk. They're like, you know, kind of dazed. And it's because there's such a light and weight and light and it as in light filled body that they're trying to get settled back in into this denser, heavier meat suit, because that's what this is. This is a meat suit. It's a flesh and bone carnal body. So you do have a little adjustment period. And some people can't talk for a while, and then other people can talk a little bit. You know, everybody's different. You know, it depends on how resistant you are to the energy, and there's all sorts of factors. And one is not better, you know, one reaction is not better than the other. It's, you know, we all have our own, it's like, you know, just like our thumbprint. Everybody has a different thumbprint, your energetic thumbprint and how you are going to experience the movement of energy. It's a tremendous amount of energy that you're moving in your system. So nobody knows how they're going to react in advance. You have no idea. You just have to accept, believe in the sun accept, believe, and surrender to the experience so that you can allow the greater levels of consciousness, you know, whatever the volume of energy that is going to go through you so that you can get to whatever that other realm is so that you can learn, be, experience, whatever it is that is there for you, that you can go there and you, you yourself don't get in the way of stopping that. Because all you have to do is in meditation if you try to make it happen it's gone it stops if you try to see something more clearly it's gone it stops it's such a bummer when that happened that happened to me so many times where i would try to take a closer look or i tried to have a more mystical experience automatically everything just goes black you're in void and it just stops and then for me the rest of the meditation is just that's it. You know, it's like, ah, oh, I got, I got in my own way. And that's so frustrating because I have nobody to blame but myself for that. And so I'm just telling you so that I shorten your learning curve. Dr. Joe did tell us, he did warn us, you know, prior to that training at the advanced in the monastery, I didn't know that. So it was everything that I did all the years of prior meditation. I was unaware that my trying was the very thing. It was me getting in my own way of my own progress and I hadn't put two and two together. And I think that's why I've had such a quantum leap. Once I went to the monastery, once I started to get through this advanced training, once I started to up you know, the amount of meditation that I was doing with specific applied instruction that now I had a greater intellectual understanding of exactly what was going on so i hope this helps at least one of you out there that's watching this video at this time okay this is the instant the brain and the body receive a biological upgrade that's the good news that's what you've been wanting so even if you didn't think you need a biological upgrade i think everybody should sign up for a biological upgrade if there's a way of optimizing your body then just think about it You've got a cell phone. If you can optimize your cell phone's performance so that the battery lasts longer, so that it holds a greater amount of memory, you, know, you can store more video, you can store more pictures, you know, HD pictures and so forth, 4K, whatever the case might be. If you could optimize your computer so that it works faster, more efficiently, et cetera, et cetera, why would you say no to that? On the contrary, you know, when would now be the time for you to say yes to optimizing your computer, your cell phone, your body? Sign me up. So if someone can sit in a chair with their eyes closed during meditation and have a significantly heightened sensory experience without their senses, it begs to question what is happening in the brain to explain 
the supernatural effect to the person having the experience despite the fact that they are sitting still it seems more real than any other experience determined by the senses that they've ever had this begs more inquiry how can we have a fully amplified sensory experience without our senses what are the specific functions of the brain and body that translate interactions with the quantum field into profound inner experiences hit the pause button again well i don't know what to tell you about this again in my experience it's true what he says here when you are in that 5d realm and you have that profound mystical experience you're having a biological upgrade yeah when i had the mystical the one on the march 22nd i was being i don't want to say violently because it sounds like it's like you know really you know um it sounds like it would be painful and it wasn't painful it was um it was jarring because i kept on getting pulled to the left and i knew that it wasn't just in 5d that i felt my body being pulled i felt that you know the little humanoid they were like child like beings that kept on pulling me there was a whole bunch of them all the way around me and they kept on pulling me to the left and i knew that they were adjusting something i knew they were doing something to me and it was like when it started it was it was subtle and then it got more and more and more and then all of a sudden i realized i'm like oh it was kind of a rhythmic jarring kind of a feeling so i felt it in that realm and it was very real in that realm because i was in that realm i was really clear somehow i had i don't know 20 of them or something that were talking all at the same time in this what sounded like a freight train harmonica accordion thx hd you know surround sound and apparently they were all different conversations and somehow i was able to understand all of them and was very clear about what all of them were telling me simultaneously in this realm we can't do that but in that realm somehow i was able to do that and i identified my body as being the same as it is here in one of the realms actually in two of the realms in the first realm um they made it clear to me and they had me look at my hand and then my hand went from what my hand looks like right now and then there was a change you'll have to watch the video to hear that part so i was aware that i was the same body but i was also another body and then in the other realms i still had the awareness that i was still me and then like i said i had another adjustment and then that thing happened again with those little beings that were like child like beings they did some sort of adjustment to me again and i was aware i could feel that i was moving and i couldn't stop it it was uncontrollable so it's interesting that he talks here how it is more real than this 3d realm oh make no mistakes it is very real you are very there's nothing you're not foggy brain you would think that it would feel more dreamlike and it would be more foggy elusive if you know it is like a virtual it's not even like a virtual reality it's it's like right here and it is a very but it's a it doesn't look anything like you that's the thing it doesn't look anything like you it looks completely different but you're very aware you're very awake and your a your level of understanding is like universally exponentially heightened to uh the nth degree like to an unlimited degree how i could keep track of all those conversations at the same time i have no idea it's just what i experienced in that during that particular mystical experience pretty cool all right so moving on so he goes on to say here and we are right now on page for those of you who are wondering we are on page 300 in other words if we can interface with a more coherent field of information which then creates such stimulating inner events like 
that was a very stimulating neuro event. There must be a neurological, chemical, and biological explanation for such supernatural occurrences. What are the unique systems, organs, glands, tissues, chemicals, neurotransmitters, and cells involved that could give rise to such intensely profound experiences? Could there be physiological components that are just sitting dormant, waiting to be activated? Four states of consciousness will help provide a framework for this information in this chapter. So the first is wakefulness, which of course is when we are aware and conscious. So next is sleep, where we are unconscious and the body is restoring and repairing. Then comes dreaming, which is an altered state of consciousness when our body is catatonic, but our minds are engaged in inner visual imagery and symbolism. And finally, there are transcendental moments of consciousness that are beyond our understanding and reality. And these transcendental events seem to change us and the way we look at the world forever. So I wanna give you my best understanding about biology, chemistry, and neuroscience of those transcendental experiences. So let's start with the molecule, melatonin, good old Mel. Melatonin, which is responsible for all of this. Okay, the next section is called melatonin, the dreaming neurotransmitter. I must have a lot of melatonin because I dream in 3D, full color, always have my entire life. As a child, I used to have, my dreams were so vivid that I oftentimes could not tell the difference whether I was actually in my dream or if I was actually alive. And so I would test and touch things to make sure because I would ask myself in my dream and I would also ask myself in my wakeful state if I really was, if I was actually alive in my real state or if I was actually in my dreaming state. I would sometimes do that at school. Sometimes on a Saturday morning, I'd wake up and I'm like, okay, am I still dreaming? Or is this, am I really alive? Crazy to think, but that's how I was. Melatonin, the dreaming neurotransmitter. And Dr. Joe calls melatonin Mel. So when you wake up in the morning and return to the world of your senses, the moment your eye perceives light through your iris, receptors in the optic nerve, that's in the back of your eyeball, in case you didn't know. You've got your eyeball, it's like an egg. Okay, and you have your iris, which is the color of your eye. You've got your pupil, and in the back of the eye, in the back part of that orbit, sits your optic nerve. That would be the equivalent of where it would be, in case you're wondering. So that optic nerve, so the light hits your iris and it hits your pupil. Your pupil, as the light comes in, it contracts and then the light hits the optic nerve, which is in the back of your eyeball. So it sends a signal to a part of your brain called the suprachiasmic nucleus. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus, it then sends a signal to which responds by making serotonin the daytime transmitter. So Dr. Joe calls serotonin Sarah. Sarah gets you up in the morning, Mel puts you to bed at night. It's the easiest way to remember when your body produces melatonin and when your body produces serotonin. So serotonin is what gets you up in the morning. So as you will recall, neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that transmit and communicate information between nerve cells and the neurotransmitter serotonin tells your body it's time to wake up and start your day and as you integrate information between all your senses in order to create meaning between your inner world and your outer world serotonin stimulates your brain waves from delta to theta to alpha to beta causing you to once again realize you're in a physical body in space and time thus when your brain is firing in beta brain waves, you put much of your attention on your 
outer environment and your body as well as time and that's normal so as night falls like it is now it gets dark a similar but inverse process occurs inverse opposite so the inhibition of light sends a signal along the same route back to the pineal gland but now the pineal gland transmutes serotonin into melatonin the nighttime transmitter it's the nighttime neurotransmitter it's a little messenger so this production and release of melatonin slows down your brain waves from beta to alpha making you sleepy tired and less likely to want to think or to analyze which by the way i'm going to hit the pause button here when you are tired and less likely to want to think or analyze that is the perfect time for you to do a meditation why would that be a perfect time for us to do a meditation Maria? i'm so glad you asked that question because when you are tired and less likely to want to analyze to use your critical thinking faculties guess what you not only is that a signal of having a higher level of melatonin but you are now going to surrender to the present moment you are able to go into theta state far more you slip into it like this effortlessly and then you're able to have a more profound mystical experience and you are more likely to experience a biological upgrade so that is why that's why monks typically get up at four o'clock in the morning to do their meditations at four four o'clock four thirty in the morning because melatonin is at its highest between one o'clock and four thirty in the morning that's why when we are in the monastery with dr joe he has us in our seats at three thirty in the morning and the doors close and at four o'clock sharp four o'clock in the morning we start our meditations and i gotta tell you it is glorious the energy in that room is palpable there's so much love in that room it is the most buttery delicious form of um, unconditional love that i have probably ever experienced and there was a uh, one lady who who uh, kept on saying, oh my gosh, I don't need a husband anymore. Oh my gosh, I don't need a husband anymore. Such a funny lady. That she was hysterical. Okay? So as your brain waves, your brain waves are slowing down to alpha, you become more interested in returning your attention to your inner world rather than your outer world. Eventually, as your body falls asleep and goes into a catatonic state your brain waves move from alpha to theta to delta thus inducing periods of dreaming as well as a deep restorative sleep and by living within the rhythm of our external environment within this diurnal pattern of wakefulness and sleep based on where we live in the world our brain automatically it becomes automatically entrained to the daily production of these chemicals at very specific times in the morning and evening so this is called the circadian rhythm so most of us know that when we move out of this natural rhythm we become out of sorts such as when we travel to another part of the world where the sun rises and sets at several hours ahead of your normal time zone this is jet lag and we need some time to recalibrate so when the body gets out of its natural circadian rhythm it will usually take a few days to readjust to the new environment's rhythm of sunrise and sunset this is all chemistry produced from our in, you know our interaction with the external three-dimensional world so from our eyes reaction to the sun and the frequency of the visible light so melatonin induces rapid eye movement REM sleep which is a phase of circadian rhythm that causes dreaming so as the thoughts and chatter in our heads diminish giving way to sleep and eventually the dreaming state the brain begins to internally see and perceive images 
pictures and symbols. So, but before we get into why melatonin is so important, let's take a closer look at the molecular structure of this dreaming neurotransmitter. So the process of creating melatonin starts with the essential amino acid L-tryptophan, the raw material that's responsible for making serotonin and melatonin. Isn't that cool? So to be converted into melatonin, it must pass through a series of chemical changes known as methylation. Methylation is the process of taking a single carbon and three hydrogens known as a methyl group and applying it to countless critical functions throughout our entire body, such as thinking, repairing DNA, turning genes on and off, fighting infections, and so on and so on. In this case, it's part of the production of melatonin. And hit the pause button too. One of the, the things that happens to our body on an actual cellular level, he actually doesn't talk about it here, but from having been a uh, pre-med biological science major, one of the things that I rem remember when we were studying the digestive system and so forth, is that your body, as it takes nutrients in, it methylates at a cellular level. It takes nutrients in through your mouth. It gets taken, obviously, through your digestive system as you receive it through your digestive system. Then nutrients are leaked or released. It's absorbed from the lining of the stomach and the intestinal walls and so forth into your bloodstream. Once it gets into your bloodstream, then it hits all the cells of your body. And depending on how, how well, I'm gonna use the word calibrated, your body is, either your cells will appropriately methylate the nutrients that all the cells need to be in optimal health, or it won't, which is why you can have the right amount of, let's say, iron intake, so that when they do a blood test, it shows that you have enough iron, and yet you're still showing that you're, you have anemia. So how is it possible that your iron, you have enough iron in your blood, but you're still anemic? Well, that's because your cells are not methylating. They're not digesting the available iron that's available in the blood. So therefore, the cell can't absorb that iron, so it doesn't digest it on the inside of the cell. It just swims around the outside of the cell. So the cells don't get the benefit of the iron, even though the blood has plenty of iron in it. So then you're still anemic because you're not methylating properly. And there's a solution for that. In fact, these meditations take care of that too. It takes care of pretty much everything. Okay, I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, just put it in the comments below. I'll do my best, I promise, to get back to you and answer you. And if I don't have an answer to the question, Trust me, I have plenty of doctors that I deal with that can give you a very specific answer. And I can always refer you to them if you need, you know, something above my pay grade. I don't have any issue referring you. So in figure 12.1, we see methylation in action. So because this methyl group is made up of very stable chemicals, the basic structure of the five and six sided rings stay the same during the series of chemical reactions. Everything is chemistry. So however, as different groups of molecules attached to those rings, they change the properties and characteristics of the molecule. So beginning with the L-tryptophan and the pineal gland transmutes it into 5-hydroxytryptophan, that's 5-HTP, which then becomes serotonin. Serotonin is a more stable molecule than 5-HTP, can sustain itself in the brain and has more useful function as we'll soon see. Through another chemical reaction, the pineal gland converts serotonin into N-acetylserotonin, and then an additional reaction turns it into melatonin. And all of this happens in the pineal gland in a 24-hour cycle. The production of melatonin is highest between the hours of 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. This is important to remember because the methylation process of the amino acid L-tryptophan into serotonin and melatonin. So we now know there's an inverse, an inverse relationship 
between our adrenal hormones and melatonin. As adrenal cortisol levels go up, melatonin levels go down. Listen carefully, as adrenal, so as you're stressed and your adrenal glands are releasing cortisol, as those levels are going up because you're stressed, you're freaked out, you're nervous, you're worried, you're anxious, your melatonin levels go down. So this is the reason why we can't sleep when we're under stress. In antiquity, this served as a biological safety mechanism because for instance, instance if you were chased by a predator, like a saber-toothed tiger, a few times on the way to the watering hole, and then you spotted more large beasts in your territory, your body and its innate intelligence would want to prevent you from becoming prey yourself. In such cases, sleep and restoration became less important than surviving. More aptly put, staying alive by remaining awake through the night is more valuable than sleeping and risking death. So when the body is trying to rest in this vigilant, it's a hypervigilant state, it never gets the restorative sleep it needs because the survival chemicals like cortisol have switched on the survival genes. So if the perceived stressor is not a saber-toothed tiger, but instead your strained relationship with your ex-spouse, whom you must interact with daily, that chronic stress keeps the survival system activated. Now the safety valve is no longer adaptive, but maladaptive. This type of chronic stress alters typical levels of melatonin and even serotonin knocking your body out of homeostasis. So it's out of balance now. But if you lower the levels of, co of cortisol, melatonin levels will then increase. So in other words, when you break the stress response by overcoming the emotional addiction to those chemicals, your body can go back to long-term building projects instead of constantly dealing with the perceived emergency. So now take a look at figure 12.2 to review the relationship between melatonin, that's what you need to go to sleep, and cortisol, which is the stress hormone that your adrenal glands produce. That's why some people have adrenal fatigue because it's like your adrenal, if you're constantly in a fight or flight and you have, you know, if you live in a, you know, for example, ER doctors, ER doctors, ER surgeons, they're constantly hitting the overdrive, overdrive, overdrive button on their adrenal glands because as especially those who are in big cities where you have, you're working in a large trauma center, like for example, medical school, but you, USC Harbor General in, in Los Angeles, that's a crazy emergency room. The amount of shootings and stabbings and it's just, a gory place to, to, to have to work in. And it's like, you know, the, the volume of trauma, of severe life and death trauma. It's like, you know, you're always running. It's a 24 hour shift that's run, 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 run the whole time. So you're constantly hitting, you know, the adrenals. Well, you're gonna burn out over time if you don't take time to truly rest and relax. If you don't know of a way to have coping mechanisms for that type of environment, then you're going to burn out your adrenal glands. God help you. So back to the book. As stress hormones go up, melatonin levels go down. So as stress hormones go down, melatonin levels go up. So as you look at the chart showing some of the benefits of melatonin, melatonin has many other interesting applications. So for example, it's been proven to improve carbohydrate metabolism. Isn't that incredible? that melatonin affects your metabolizing carbohydrates. I find that fascinating. So this is important because when certain people respond to stress, the body takes carbohydrates and stores them as fat. And fat is nothing more than stored energy. And this is a result of primitive genes signaling the body to store energy in case there's a famine. So melatonin has also been known to help with depression. It's even been proven to increase levels of DHEA, the anti-aging hormone. For more facts about the importance of melatonin, the dreaming neurotransmitter, take a look at figure 12.3 in your book.
So now let's deepen your understanding of all the information you've been studying in this book up until this point. I like this, There's, it's like a summary. So activating the pineal gland. So for years, I spent enormous amounts of time studying the pineal gland and seeking researchers who did extensive measurements of the metabolites and the tissue. My interest was in tying together my findings with some ancient mysteries. So one abstract in particular piqued my interest and the pineal gland is a neuroendocrine transducer secreting melatonin responsible for physiological circadian rhythm control. A new form of biomineralization has been studied in the human pineal gland and consists of a small of small crystals that are less than 20 microns in length. These crystals are responsible for electromechanical biological transduction mechanism in the pineal gland due to the structure and piezoelectric properties. Someday I will memorize that script right there. That's a lot of words to digest, but let's break it down into two meaningful points. I'm still reading the book. This is not me speaking. The key words here in reverse order are piezoelectric properties and transducer. Pay close attention. Piezoelectric properties and transducer. The piezoelectric effect occurs when you apply pressure to certain materials and that mechanical stress is changed into an electrical charge. To put it in simple terms, the pineal gland contains calcite, crystals made of calcium, carbon, and oxygen. And because of the structure, they express this effect like an antenna. The pineal gland has the capacity to become electrically activated and generate electromagnetic fields that can tune into information. That's the point, number one. In addition, in the same way an antenna pulsates a rhythm or a frequency to match the frequency of an incoming signal, the pineal gland receives information carried on in an invisible electromagnetic field. It's doing that inside your head. It's picking up the frequencies. Since all frequency carries information, once that antenna connects to the exact same signal of the electromagnetic field, there must be a way to convert and descramble that signal into a meaningful message. And that's exactly what a transducer does. And that's the second point. So a transducer, a transducer is anything that receives a signal in the form of one type of energy and converts it into a signal in another form. So take a moment to look around you. The space you are sitting in is filled with TV, radio, and Wi-Fi waves that are all different frequency ranges of invisible electromagnetic frequency and energy. You can't see any of them with your, not with your natural eyes, but they're still there. For example, the antenna that picks up a range of frequencies carrying a signal to your TV is transduced into a picture on your TV screen. When you tune into an FM station on your radio, you are tuning your antenna to a specific electromagnetic frequency. The information carried in that frequency range is then transduced into a coherent signal, which is the music you hear with your ears. So the study I quoted says the pineal gland is a neuroendocrine transducer capable of receiving and converting signals within the brain. So when the pineal gland acts as a transducer, it can pick up the frequencies above our three-dimensional space and time sensory-based reality. And once that pineal gland is activated, it can tune into higher dimensions of this space and time, which we learned in the previous chapter, is the realm of time space. And like a TV, it can turn on the information carried on in those frequencies into 
vivid imagery and surreal, lucid, transcendental experiences inside our mind, including profound heightened multisensory visions beyond our vocabulary. This is a bit like experiencing a multidimensional IMAX movie. So at this point, you may be wondering, since this little gland exists inside my skull, how am I going to exert mechanical stress on the crystals in it, create a piezoelectric effect, and activate the pineal gland so it becomes like an antenna? And how will that antenna pick up frequencies and information beyond matter and light so that it can transduce those electromagnetic signatures into a meaningful imagery, like a transcendental experience beyond this three-dimensional reality. So for the pineal gland to become activated, four important things must happen, and I will address three of them right now. And then I will give you the fourth step when it's time to learn the meditation. So number one, the piezoelectric effect. Critical to creating the piezoelectric effect in the pineal gland are the calcite crystals mentioned above and shown in figure 12.4. Please look in your books at figure 12.4. If you're on Audible, get the book, get the Kindle version, or get the paperback. See the paperbacks over there? So either get the paperback, I suggest you get both. If you get Kindle and paperback, then you can listen to this again. As you're getting ready in the morning, you could listen to all this information again, or you could replay these YouTube videos that I have created here for you about this review and this discussion, and then you can get re-familiarized and start to learn this information at a deeper level. So critical to creating the piezoelectric effect in the pineal gland are the calcite crystals mentioned above and shown in figure 12.4. So remember, these are very tiny little crystals, just one to 20 microns in length. So to put this context, their size, can range anywhere from one one hundredth to one quarter the width of a human hair. So for the most part, they are octahedron, hexahedron, and rhombohedron in shape. So as we already learned in chapter five, the purpose of the breathing technique you do before many meditations is to pull the mind out of the body by liberating potential energy stored as emotions in the lower three energy centers. And as we inhale and contract those intrinsic muscles as it's coming up, follow our breath from the perineum all the way up our spine to the top of our head and then hold, you're gonna hold it at the top of your head and then breathe and squeeze those muscles more. We're increasing the intrathecal pressure. And as I mentioned earlier in this book, this is the internal pressure created when you push up against your insides. For example, when you hold your breath and lift something heavy, the word piezoelectric is derived from the Greek word piezin, which means to squeeze or to press and piezo. So it's no coincidence that I ask you to hold your breath and squeeze those intrinsic muscles. So when you do this, you are pushing the cerebral spinal fluid. It's like you're wringing your cerebral spinal fluid. You, know, you have your column of your spine and it's like you're squeezing up the cerebral spinal fluid like it's going up a straw. You do this, you are pushing cerebral spinal fluid up against the pineal gland, exerting mechanical stress on it. This mechanical stress translates into an electrical charge and it's this exact action that compresses the stacked crystals in the pineal gland and creates the piezoelectric effect because the crystals, there's five of them, one, two, three, four, five, and they start to shimmer and they start to vibrate and as they fi vibrate, they expand out and contract and expand out and contract and expand out and contract until they get to a point where they're moving so fast that boom, it creates the piezoelectric effect. And then your little antenna that's on the top of your pineal gland pops up. So this mechanical stress translates into an electrical charge and it's this exact action that compresses the stacked crystals in the pineal gland and creates the piezoelectric effect. The crystals of the pineal gland generate an electrical charge in response to the stress, the stress that you're providing by the breath and by 
pulling those muscles, those intrinsic muscles up and you're creating that intrafecal pressure. So a picture of a calcite crystal found in the pineal gland. One of the unique characteristics of the piezoelectric effect is it's reversible, meaning that the materials exhibiting the direct piezoelectric effect, the crystals, also exhibit a converse piezoelectric effect. So once the crystals in the glands are compressed and are creating an electric charge or an electrical charge, the electromagnetic field that is emanating from the pineal gland causes the crystals in it to stretch as the field increases. And when the crystals generating the electromagnetic field reach their limit where they've stretched as far as they can go, and they can't stretch any further, they contract and the electromagnetic field reverses the direction, moves them inward to the pineal gland. And when the electromagnetic field reaches the pineal gland crystals, it compresses them again, producing that expansion, expanding, contracting, expanding and contracting as they shimmer, it creates, just like you're creating an electromagnetic field outside of your body, the pineal gland is also creating its own little electromagnetic field around it. Isn't that cool? This cycle of expanding and reversing the field perpetuates a pulsating electromagnetic field. When we inhale through our nose and at the same time squeeze our intrinsic muscles, we accelerate the cerebral spinal fluid into the brain. As we follow that movement from the base of our spine all the way up to the top of our head, then hold our breath and squeeze, we are increasing the intrathecal pressure and the increased pressure moves the cerebral spinal fluid from the fourth ventricle through a small canal into the third ventricle at the same time, this is all in your brain, at the same time, fluid traveling around your cerebellum, it shows arrows in the diagram, compresses the crystals of the pineal gland. And that mechanical stress that is applied produces an electrical charge in the pineal gland, creating the piezoelectric effect. And it's no wonder then that I ask you to hold your breath, squeeze, and contract those muscles. And it's no surprise that I insist you repeat this process over and over and over again. As you keep doing the breath and holding and squeezing again, again, and again, with every cycle of breath, you are activating piezoelectric properties of the pineal gland. So now the more you do this, the more you speed up the cycles per second of expansion and contraction of this electromagnetic field, making the pulses get faster and faster. Now the pineal gland becomes a pulsating antenna. Now the antenna is actually doing this on top of your pineal gland. Now the pineal gland becomes a pulsating antenna capable of picking up subtler and subtler, faster electromagnetic frequencies. Take a close look at figure 12.5 and we talked about the movement of the cerebral spinal fluid during the breath in chapter 5. But now let's build on this teaching and as the fluid starts to enter your brain, it moves up through the central canal, through the space between the spinal column and the spinal cord. From this juncture, it flows in two directions. First, the fluid moves into the fourth ventricle, followed by the third ventricle. As the fluid travels from the fourth to the third ventricle, it passes through a narrow path or channel nestled right at the back of the third ventricle, and it rests what looks like a tiny little pine cone. That's what pineal means. It means pine cone. This is the pineal gland, and it's about the size of a large rice grain. Second, the cerebral spinal fluid also flows around the back of the cerebellum to the other side of the pineal gland surrounding the entire gland with pressurized fluid. By increasing the intrathecal pressure, you funnel a greater volume of fluid into the chamber of the third ventricle as well as from the space around the cerebellum. So when you hold your breath and squeeze this extra volume of fluid, it's exerting pressure from both directions up against the crystals, causing them to compress. You know, they're like this, but they're being compressed in this direction, causing them to compress and create this piezoelectric effect. This is the first event that must take place to activate the pineal gland. So the pineal gland releases metabolites. So the cerebral spinal fluid moves 
through a closed system called the ventricular system. Now review figure 12.5 to take a look at that. The ventricular system facilitates the movement of this fluid from the base of the spine up through the spinal column, through the four chambers of the brain called aqueducts or ventricles and back down the sacrum, the base of the spine. And the sacrum, if you don't know this, it's shaped like a triangle. I'll make my but it's actually this way. So it's shaped like a triangle at the base of your spine down here. So when you inhale and follow your breath at the top of your head and then hold your breath and squeeze up and in, you are accelerating the cerebral spinal fluid. And on the surface of the pineal gland are tiny little hairs called cilia, Latin for eyelashes. See figure 12.6 to take a look at this. The action of the accelerated fluid moving faster than normal through the chambers of the ventricular system tickles the tiny little hairs which overstimulate the pineal gland. Because the pineal gland is shaped like a phallus, the stimulation produced by the acceleration of the fluid moving past it combined with the electrical activation created by an increase in intrathecal pressure in a closed system causes the gland to ejaculate some very profound upgraded metabolites of melatonin into the brain. You're now one step closer to activating that pineal gland and having a transcendental experience. So the tiny cilia of the pineal gland become stimulated as the cerebral spinal fluid accelerates through the ventricular system. Energy is delivered directly into the brain through that process, much like sending a rocket ship into space, overcoming gravity because it's having to go up and gravity's pulling us down. So to get it off the ground is the part that requires the most energy. So to move that energy from our lower centers demands a great deal of intensity and effort. The breath becomes our passionate intention to free ourselves from the self-limiting emotions of our past. So the spinal column becomes the delivery mechanism for this energy and the top of our head becomes the target. So as you know by now, every time we perform the breath, you send charged particles up the spinal column. And as these particles increase in velocity and acceleration, they create what's known as an inductance field. Now check out figure 12.7 for that. This inductance field reverses the flow of a two-way information that typically facilitates communication from the brain to the body and the body to the brain. And much like a vacuum, this inductance field draws energy from the lower three centers, energy involved with orgasm, conception, digestion, fight or flight, stress, and control and delivers it directly to the brain stem in a spiraling motion. So the energy from those three energy centers is gonna come up your spinal column as you're doing the breath, and it's swirling up like this, like a coil, okay? As the energy travels up through each vertebrae, it passes the nerves that run from the spinal cord to different parts of the body, and some of the energy is then transferred through the peripheral nerves that affect the tissues and organs of the body. So the current that runs along these nerve channels activate the body's meridian system. That's part of that biological upgrade. And that's why your body feels so fantastic afterwards. So resulting in all the other systems of the body getting more energy, because now all your energy, all your meridians are now fully open. Your energy centers are open and all the meridians throughout your entire, the entire map of all the meridians are all completely blown open. Very cool. So as the energy is released from the body to the brain, it passes by each spinal nerve existing between each vertebrae. The excitation of the system further switches on the peripheral nerves, which then transfer more energy to different tissues and organs in the body. As a result, more energy is delivered throughout the body. I'm gonna pause right here. After having read this section alone, if you have a neurological disorder of any type of, doesn't matter what kind of origin your neurological disorder is, in any way, shape, or form, you could see how 
through this process how whatever neurological damage that you might have, multiple sclerosis, uh, muscular dystrophy, Guillain-Barre, to name Parkinson's, to name a few, epileptic seizures, you can see how those conditions are going to be healed because of what's happening here biochemically and mechanistically too. Because we talked about how all the meridians, all of the energy centers are now open. All your peripheral um, nervous system, your parasympathetic, your sympathetic nervous system, and all of the meridians, which is the map of the entire body, all those energy centers are all completely you know, blown wide open. So there aren't any disconnects in, in neurological conditions. Part of the problem is there are different degrees of disconnections throughout your body, neurologically speaking. But that is no longer the case once this happens. So once the energy reaches the brainstem, it must pass through the reticular information. So again, once the energy reaches the brainstem, it must pass through the reticular formation. And it's the job of the reticular formation to constantly edit information going from the brain to the body, as well as from the body to the brain. This formation is part of the system called the reticular activating system, which is also known as the RAS which is responsible for levels of wakefulness. So for instance, when you wake up from a deep sleep because you hear a sound in your house, it's the RAS that alerts you and arouses you, that it's rudimentary function. However, as the sympathetic nervous system is activated and merges with your parasympathetic nervous system, instead of depleting the body's stored energy, it releases that energy back into the brain. And once this energy reaches the brainstem, then the thalamic gate opens up like a door and energy moves through the reticular formation to the thalamus where it relays information to the neocortex. So now the reticular formation is open and you experience greater levels of awareness and in a sense you become more conscious and more awakened. So think of the thalamus as a big train station with tracks leading to higher centers of the brain. That's how the brain goes into gamma brainwave patterns. Pause. Okay, so I'm just having an aha moment here because he says here, think of the thalamus as, and the thalamus is in the back of the head, is a big train station with tracks leading to the higher centers of the brain. That's how the brain goes into gamma wave pattern. I'm wondering if that's why in that altered state and when you're traveling in those dimensions and you're having that mystical experience, if why you hear it's like the sound of this harmonic freight train accordion thx imax 3d surround sound like vibration um, i wonder if that's why that sounds like that and i've i've had that not only in like i said that particular experience that i had on march 22nd but even you know sometimes when i meditate on an airplane i've had that where all of a sudden out of nowhere i hear i hear all these voices speaking at the same time much like i did in the in my mystical experience that i the video you'll you can you'll see it at the end if you want to click on it but it's like you hear like all these voices talking all at the same time but it but you hear like the sound of like that freight train it's a very distinct vibratory frequency and it's like the sound kind of goes like through all of you. It's kind of a very distinct feeling. So there must be some connection between that, the thalamus and the gamma brainwave patterns is, is what I'm picking up from this right here. Another piece of the puzzle. So right between each thalamus located in the midbrain, which is where your pineal gland, your pineal gland is in the midbrain, not in the forebrain. Right between each thalamus, left and the right thalamus, located in the midbrain sits the tiny pine cone shaped pineal gland facing the back of the brain. And as a side note, there are two individual thalami in the midbrain, one on each side, which feed each hemisphere in the neocortex. The pineal gland sits right between them, facing the back of the brain. So see figure 12.8. When the energy reaches each thalamic junction, remember, the thalamus is like a relay station to all other parts of the brain. 
So these thalami send a message directly to the pineal gland to receive, to receive. Okay, it sends a message directly to the pineal gland to secrete its metabolites into the brain. The effect is that the thinking neocortex becomes aroused and goes into higher brainwave patterns like gamma. The nature of those chemical derivatives of melatonin relaxes the body at the same time awakens the mind. If you remember when you're in beta brain waves, your sympathetic nervous system is aroused for an emergency in your outer world and utilizes energy to survive. The difference with gamma brain waves is that instead of losing vital energy, you're liberating and creating more energy in your body. You're not in any emergency or survival state when this occurs. You're in bliss and your sympathetic nervous system is switching on to arouse you to pay more attention to whatever is happening in, in your mind in that dimension. So in chapter five, I said that when energy moves from the body to the brain, a torus field is created around your entire body. And as you run a current up your spinal column by accelerating the movement of cerebral spinal fluid, your body becomes like a magnet and you create an electromagnetic field around it. A torus field represents a dynamic flow of energy. And at the same time, the torus field is moving up and out and around your body. When the pineal gland becomes activated, a reverse Taurus field of electromagnetic energy is drawing energy into your body. So it's, you have, it's a phenomena where you have an inverse relationship of two things going. You have your electromagnetic field is fanning out. And at the same time, you have also an electric magnetic field that is drawing, it's, it's coming from outside and it's drawing inside of your body. So you have both that are going on simultaneously. So, and it's being coming and it's coming in through your head. So since all the frequency carries information, now your pineal gland is receiving information from beyond visible light field and from beyond your five senses. So see figure 12.9. When these three happenings occur in tandem, it's going to feel like you're having an orgasm in your head. Pause. I've never felt an orgasm in my head. So he's saying it's going to feel like you've had an orgasm in my in your head. I've heard people who've had heartgasms, they've had brain gasms. <laughs> I can't wait for the day when I'll feel a heartgasm or a brain gasm. So it's not a requirement for you to go to other dimensions, for you to have a mystical experience, for you to have biological upgrades. Yada blah blah da, yada yada blah. Da. There is no right or wrong. Everybody is different. Your experience is unique, as unique to you as your thumbprint. So I'm hoping that at some time in the future, I am lucky enough to have a heart gasm and a brain gasm. Gosh, wouldn't that be mind blowing? No pun intended. To have a heart gasm and a brain gasm at the same time, that would be so cool. Okay, so you've now created. And then, let me, how many of you guys, just out of curiosity, how many of you guys, would you put in the comments below if you're interested in having a heart gasm or brain gasm? Just thought I'd take an informal poll here and see if any of you are interested in that kind of thing or, eh, nah, you could take it or leave, you're not interested. That's fine, you know. It's like chocolate chip cookies. Some people like them, some don't. Who cares? Some will, some won't, so what? All right, moving on. <laughs> So now you've created an antenna in your brain, and this antenna is picking up information from realms beyond matter and beyond space and time. Information is no longer coming from your senses or your eyes interacting with your environment. Instead, you're getting information from the quantum field moving to another eye, your third eye, from the pineal gland in the back of your brain as energy from the lower three centers is activated during the breath and moves up your spine to the brain a torus field of electromagnetic energy is created around the body so when the pineal gland becomes activated a reverse torus field of electromagnetic energy is moving in the opposite direction like i said you got them going in both directions one one is you creating your electromagnetic 
field out and another one is feeding you electromagnetic frequencies and the energy comes in through your head and circles back around. Since energy is frequency and frequency carries information, pineal gland transduces that information into vivid imagery. So when melatonin gets an upgrade, magic happens. And when your pineal gland or your third eye is awakened because it is picking up higher frequencies, these higher energies alter the chemistry of melatonin. And the higher the frequency, the greater the alteration. And it's the translation of that information into chemistry that primes you for those transcendental mystical moments. And now that you're opening that door to higher dimensions of space and time, this is why I like to call the pineal gland an alchemist, because it transmutes melatonin into some very profound, radical neurotransmitters. Very cool. Okay, I'm going to stop and pause, because one of the things that I've noticed in my own personal experience is that that you're also able to perceive and pick up things even outside of meditation there's no question as you do this work you are going to have certain things that are going to be called to your attention and you're going to recognize become aware understand and realize that you have certain doorways and portals that are that are open to you so one of the things that i realized is that wow it really became it was just profoundly um like in my awareness that when Dr. Joe says that gratitude and appreciation are the ultimate state of receivership, it's, it's as accurate as you can become. Because as I have been in a state of gratitude and appreciation where I wasn't doing a formal meditation, I wasn't sitting, standing, walking, laying down, doing any kind of a meditation, I've been just in joy and in glee and it's like i'm making my you know my acai juice and i'm adding my wholesaling husks to it i'm like adding a few reishi drops to it to it and i'm like oh thank you thank you thank you the divine i'm like oh my gosh i'm the luckiest girl alive and i'm like just thank you for everything and i'm just in a pure state of joy of gratitude just for me being me for being so in love with myself, with life, just feeling the experience of love. It's like everything is so beautiful around me. And then I pick up vibrational frequencies and I hear messages, which I'm not expecting because I'm just, I'm just in gratitude. I'm in appreciation. I am just showering the divine and I'm just expressing how grateful and how appreciative I am. And then then the downloads start to happen. And I'm like, oh, I mean, I've had downloads before, but I did not see the direct correlation between being in a state of gratitude and appreciation and how that created a state of receivership where then, because I, my heart is already open, my pineal gland, I've already done the work to, to open those things up. And now it's like, so then I, I hear of things that I've never, words I've never heard of, terminology, explanations, which causes me to ask, I'm like, well, what's, okay, so I've been given X, Y, Z, well, you know, okay, I'm thankful for this, and now you're telling me to be thankful for that. I don't even know what that is. How can I be thankful for something I don't even know? What is that? And then that's revealed. It's like, whoa, this is, this is a pretty cool experience to be in which just encourages you to be in more gratitude and in more appreciation now your feedback loop instead of being one with your negative thoughts feelings and emotions it's with the positive thoughts feelings and emotions that are just going to magnify and help you create more of a better more magnificent more loved filled life no matter what your externals are doesn't matter married, divorced, single, whatever your status is, you are in such a place of love. You're feeling so whole and so complete that you are just, you're just jazzed. You're, you know, one of my mentors, Brian Buffini, used to say, I'm just all jacked up. He's an Irishman. And, uh, you know, for us in the States, you know, to be all jacked up is like to be all messed up. But 
my definition of that of what that meant changed for me because he kept on saying i'm all jacked up as in i'm like i'm hyper i'm like just stoked i'm like thrilled i'm like you know i'm happy and so um, now i say that i'm like i'm all jacked up i'm all excited so i hope you are too so check out the different metabolites of melatonin that are created when the pineal gland connects to the frequencies faster than normal visible light and the mystical molecule gets a biological upgrade imagine that now take a look at figure 12.10 as higher frequencies and higher states of consciousness interact with the pineal gland one of the first things to happen is that these frequencies transmute melatonin into chemicals called benzodiazepines i'm going to say that again because it's a big word benzodiazepines benzodiazepines are a class of drugs from which Valium is created that anesthetize the analytical mind. So all of a sudden, the thinking brain relaxes and stops analyzing. So according to functional brain scans, benzodiazepines suppress neural activity in the amygdala, the brain's survival center. This limits chemicals that cause you to feel fear anger and agitation. I'm going to say that again. Benzodiazepine suppresses neural activity in the amygdala, the brain's survival center. And this is going to limit chemicals that cause you to feel fear, anger, agitation, aggression, sadness, or pain. So now your body feels calm and relaxed, but your mind is alert and awakened. And this is a naturally occurring drug that your pineal transmutes, it alchemizes the melatonin and turns it into benzodiazepine, which I think is very, very cool. It's naturally occurring. So another chemical created from melatonin produces a class of very powerful antioxidants called pinolines, coming from pineal gland, pinolines. So pinolines are important because they attack free radicals which harm your cells and cause aging. These antioxidants are anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-heart disease, anti-stroke, anti-neurodegenerative, anti-inflammatory, anti-microbial. These antioxidants are anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-heart disease, anti-stroke, anti-neurodegenerative, anti-inflammatory, anti-microbial. And that's a perfect formula to upgrade melatonin's normal role as an antioxidant to the role of a supercharged antioxidant that further restores and heals the body to a greater degree than the melatonin molecule normally does. So see the powerful antioxidants that are listed in figure 12.10 that are all produced from metabolites of melatonin. So let's take a look at that list again because now I think you're starting to wrap your brain around why meditation, doing this type of meditation, why it heals, restores, rejuvenates, and reconditions the body to a new mind, and why you can heal from a huge list, everything from cancer to Parkinson's to diabetes to mystery diseases to fibromyalgia to asthma to the list goes on and on and on. It's because the melatonin in your brain has been converted to one of those, these penalines. It's the perfect formula to upgrade melatonin's normal role as an antioxidant to the role of a supercharged antioxidant that further restores and heals the body to a greater degree than the melatonin molecule normally would. And it's creating these penalines that are antioxidants, anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-heart disease, anti-stroke, anti-neurodegenerative, anti-inflammatory, and antimicrobial. Incredible. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I think it's fascinating. So see the powerful antioxidants listed in figure 12.10 that are all produced from the metabolites of melatonin, also known as penalines. So if you take that molecule and tweak it again into a cousin of melatonin, you find that the same chemical that makes 
Animals hibernate when melatonin, which makes us sleepy and dreamy, alters just slightly into this more powerful molecule. It carries a message to extend and repair even further. This message also causes the body's metabolism to slow in some cases for months. It makes sense then that when mammals hibernate, they break the typical habits of their habitat. For example, they lose their sex drive, their appetite, their interest in or need to move about their environment and their connection to social networks. They hide to protect themselves and to feel safe. And during this time of going within, their body goes into stasis. So the same might be true for us as these values elevate because the body is no longer the mind. We temporarily lose our interest in our outer world. And because we have no biological drives and aren't distracted any longer with bodily needs, we're able to move more fully into the present moment and go deeply within. So if you're going, going to dream the dream of the future, wouldn't it be a good idea to get your body out of the way, if you take that molecule and advance it yet again, you produce the same chemical found in an electric eel. It's phosphorescent, bioluminescent chemical that amplifies energy in the nervous system. And you can refer to figure 12.10 again. And this chemical can be powerful enough to cause a significant shock. I have a strong hunch. This is the rare chemical that influences the brain to process those increased amplitudes of energy that we've repeatedly measured in our students. Just imagine an electric eel that literally lights up with energy when it gets stimulated. So that's what happens in the brain when it gets activated. But the energy and information that are created do not come from an experience in our environment that we perceive through our senses, but instead from within the brain caused by an upgrade in frequency. So when we see those high levels of energy in the brain, we know that the person is having a profound subjective experience that can be measured objectively. So think about that for a moment. The sensory input from our environment through our eyes, the pineal gland, makes serotonin and melatonin in this visible light coming from the sun causes us to move into harmony with our environment which we call the circadian rhythm as a result of this process serotonin and melatonin carry information equal to the frequency coming from the physical world because we perceive visible light and it's through our senses those molecules are inherent to humans thus they are equivalent to the realm of our three-dimensional reality so remember as einstein said that the ceiling of this material world is the speed of light he einstein said that the ceiling of this 3D material world is the speed of light. But what happens as the brain processes an increase in frequency and information from a realm beyond the senses and beyond the speed of light? Is it possible that information and energy coming from the unified field change the chemistry of melatonin to become another chemical counterpart in the brain? And could our brain translate these frequencies into a message if energy is the epiphenomenon of matter, it makes sense that the information coming, up, coming from a frequency faster than visible light would be able to alter the molecular structure of melatonin into profound elixirs within the brain. So the pineal gland is responsible for translating that information into a chemical variation of melatonin. Therefore, that molecule carries a different message equal to that frequency. That new frequency is now influencing an enhanced super chemical that's no longer natural, that's supernatural. Melatonin gets an upgrade. Not only does this phosphorescent bioless bioluminescent chemical. So not only does this phosphorescent bioluminescent chemical increase the energy in the brain, but it enhances the imagery in the mind internally perceived that looks, everything looks as though it's made of vivid surreal luminescent light. I'm going to repeat that. So not only does this phosphorescent 
bioluminescent chemical increase the energy in the brain, but it enhances the imagery the mind internally perceives so that everything looks as though it's made of vivid, surreal, luminescent light. As a result, people have reported experiencing vivid colors they've never seen before because they exist outside their known experience of the visible light spectrum. These colors appear as profound, otherworldly glowing lights in a technicolor, lucid, opalescent world of suspended beauty. I'm gonna hit the pause button here because I gotta say what I saw in the sixth, seventh, and eighth dimension, it was an opalescent, uh, mother of pearlish kind of like uh, rainbowy, but it was still white kind of a color. It's a color that doesn't exist here. Um, a very unusual opalescent type of a color. Everything appears as if emitting beautiful light made of vivid radiant energy that you can feel. This world of golden, shimmering, bright halos within and around everything appears more illuminated than your sensory based reality. And of course, it will be difficult to take your attention off of all its beauty because all of your attention is on this experience. It will seem as though you are actually there, totally present in the other world of dimension. So now take a look at figure 12.10 again. Alter melatonin one more time and you produce the chemical dimethyltryptophan, DMT, one of the most powerful hallucinogenic substances known to mankind. This is the same chemical found in ayahuasca, a traditional spiritual plant medicine used in ceremonies by the indigenous people of the Amazon. DMT's primary active ingredient is said to create spiritual visions and profound insights into the mystery of the self. When ayahuasca or other plant chemicals containing this molecule are ingested, the body receives only DMT. But when the pineal gland is activated, it receives the whole blend of aforementioned chemicals. And this causes some very profound inner experiences. I'm gonna hit the pause button here because I don't like taking drugs of any type, any, I don't take aspirin, I don't take, even when um, you know I was hit by the bus and I was given painkillers and so forth, I just used meditation uh, so that I wouldn't feel the pain and I was out of my body in meditation. Because um, I just, I, you know, all those chemicals will, I knew were going to cause other problems and I didn't want to impose on my liver and my kidneys and to stress out my adrenal glands any further and do, do who knows what damage to my spleen. So the point being is just by doing these meditations, you can get the benefit of all this pharmacopoeia from the natural pharmacy that is already built into your body. And you can access it through your breath, through this meditation, by signaling your autonomic nervous system to fire and wire and create this chemical reaction that it's just a, it's like a domino effect. All you have to do is do the meditation. You don't have to keep track of all this stuff. You just do the meditations as you do them more and more and more. You will progress, you will grow, and you will have these experiences because it's just, a, it's, it can't not occur. It's chemistry, it's neurochemistry. It's, there's the mechanical aspect of it that it's inevitable. So I think that's exciting. I remember reading about the whole DMT and it being an ayahuasca and all this other stuff. and. I was like, oh, yeah, I've heard of ayahuasca. I've never wanted, I've never had, you know, the inclination of trying any of those things. And I thought, that's amazing that your body naturally produces that. And then that some people actually take oral DMT just to trip out, I guess. So some of these experiences have been reported to create eight profound time dilation. Time appears infinite time travel journeys to the paranormal realms, visions of complex geometrical patterns, encounters with spiritual beings, and other mystical interdimensional realities. And many of our students during the pineal gland meditation report amazing encounters beyond their known physical world. So when these chemicals are released in the brain, the mind has experiences that appear more real than anything that person has ever encountered 
in their sensory-based reality. So this new dimension is difficult to articulate with language. The novel experience that results will occur as a complete unknown, and if you surrender to it, it's always worth it. And I can second that, it is definitely worth it. So tuning into higher dimensions, the pineal gland as a transducer. Tuning into higher dimensions, the pineal gland as a transducer, and depending on the translation you are using, in Matthew 6, 22, Jesus said, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. I believe he was talking about activating the pineal gland because this allows us to experience a broader spectrum of reality. And many of our students can attest to that fact when their pineal gland becomes activated. When they fully connect with the unified field, their whole body becomes filled with energy and with light. So beginning from the cosmic field, energy from beyond their senses enters the top of their head and travels down throughout their whole body. When this occurs, they experience downloadable information beyond the memory-based or predictable knowns of their daily lives. And it all begins with the chemical alteration of melatonin in the pineal gland. We're gonna stop right there. So step one is as you do the meditation and as you do the breath, the melatonin that's naturally, you're automatically producing melatonin every night, serotonin any morning, every morning. So you are just activating the melatonin and triggering it to start to create the benzodiazepine, vasopressin, yada, 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 all the way down to benzodiazepine. And then of course, dimethyltryptophan, which we just talked about in the last section. In all my research about the pineal gland, I'm I've evolved my own understanding of it into the following definition. So the pineal gland is a crystalline superconductor that sends as well as receives information through the transduction of energetic vibrational frequency signals and frequency beyond the senses, also known as the quantum, yeah, it's also known as the quantum field, and translate it, it translates it into biological tissue the brain and the mind in the form of meaningful imagery, the same way as an antenna translates different channels onto a TV screen. So when the pineal gland is activated, because you now have its tiny antenna in your brain, the higher the frequency it picks up, the more energy it exerts towards altering and transmuting the chemistry of melatonin. And as a result of this change in chemistry, you're going to get a very different experience from what melatonin normally produces. So perhaps a better way to say it is that you're going to get a clearer picture. Think of it this way. The higher the frequency, the more your experience will feel like you've gone from the picture of the 1960s to a television screen to a 360 degree IMAX 3D experience, complete with surround sound, melatonin, the dreaming neurotransmitter evolves into a more powerfully lucid neurotransmitter to make our dreams more real. So throughout this process, the pineal gland has a co-conspirator called the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland looks like a pear and it sits behind the bridge of the upper nose, right in the middle of the brain. The front, the anterior part of it is responsible for making the most of the chemicals that influence the glands and hormones associated with each of the energy centers. So once the pineal gland is activated and it releases a certain upgraded metabolites, the back posterior of the pituitary gland awakens, causing it to produce two important chemicals, oxytocin and vasopressin. Oxytocin, the love hormone. You get that when you get hugged, when you hug or get hugged, or both. That you also have oxytocin production when you kiss. Love kissing. So the first chemical, oxytocin, is known to produce elevated emotions that cause your heart to swell with love and joy. So if you didn't know it, now you know. When you have oxytocin flooding your body because you're hugging someone, you're kissing someone, it automatically floods your heart with oxytocin too, and it causes your heart to swell. It causes your heart to open it, heart, 
in your heart actually swells with the feeling of love and it's a chemical reaction okay it's been referred to as the chemical of emotional connection or the bonding hormone so when oxytocin levels are elevated above normal most people experience intense feelings of love forgiveness compassion joy wholeness and empathy not an interstate you would probably be willing to trade for something outside of you these states are after all the beginning of unconditional love <sighs> unconditional love yes that's what it's all about now you understand that song that said love is the answer it's true, love is the answer. So when oxytocin levels go up beyond a certain level, research shows that it's difficult to hold a grudge. So in a study conducted by scientists at the University of Zurich, 49 participants played a variation of what is known as the trust game 12 consecutive times. So they played the game 12 times. So in this game, an investor with a certain amount of money must decide either to keep it or to share some of it with another player called the trustee. So whatever the sum the investor shares with the trustee is automatically tripled. So the trustee is then faced with the decision, keep all of the money, leaving the investor with nothing, or share the tripled sum with the investor who is obviously hoping to make a profit. Basically the either or decision comes down to betrayal. So while a selfish act is a win for the trustee, it leaves the investor at a loss. So what if oxytocin is introduced into the equation? So in the study, the researchers gave some of the players a squirt of oxytocin in their nose before the game started, giving the others a squirt of a placebo. So the researchers then took MRI functional magnetic resonance imaging scans of the investors' brains as they made their decisions regarding the amount to invest and whether or not to trust. So after the first six rounds, the investors were given feedback on their investments and were notified that their trust had been betrayed about half of the time. The participants who received placebo before playing the game felt angry and betrayed. So they invested much less in a much less in the closing six rounds. So the participants who received a squirt of oxytocin, however, invested the same amount as they had in the first rounds, despite having been betrayed. Interesting. The fMRI scans showed the key areas of the brain affected were the amygdala, associated with fear, anxiety, stress, and aggression, and the dorsal striata which guides future behaviors based on positive feedback, and participants who received the oxytocin had much lower activities in the amygdala, equating to less anger and fear of being betrayed again, as well as less fear of financial loss. They also had much lower activity in the dorsal striatum, meaning they no longer needed to rely on positive results to make future decisions. So this is very interesting because what this suggests to me is that based on the amount of oxytocin that you have in your level, when you experience adversity in relationships, when you experience betrayal in relationships, whether it's in a personal relationship or it's a business relationship where things don't go well, your ability to forgive and to get past that and to be resilient so that you can move on and continue to grow and not stay stagnant where you don't outgrow that experience because you're held back by that experience is directly contingent upon the level of oxytocin that you have inside your body. I mean, that's exactly what this is saying. So I'm like, oh my gosh, wow. So as this study demonstrates, the moment the posterior pituitary releases its chemicals and oxytocin levels go up, this shuts down survival centers in the brain's amygdala. So that means it cools off the circuits for fear, sadness, pain, anxiety, and aggression, and anger. Then the only thing we feel is a love for life. We've measured the levels of oxytocin in our students before and after our workshops. So at the conclusion of the event, some of them had elevated their levels significantly. So when we interviewed those students, many of them kept saying, 
I'm just so in love with my life and everyone in it. I never want this feeling to go away. I want to remember this feeling forever. This is who I really am. The other chemical the pituitary gland makes as the pineal gland is activated is called vasopressin or <laughs> antidiuretic hormone. As vasopressin levels go up, the body naturally retains fluids, causing the body to become more water-based. This is important because if you're going to process a greater frequency, you need water to act as a conduit to better handle the higher frequency in the body and to then translate that frequency into your cells. So the moment vasopressin goes up, it creates a more stable thyroid gland, which affects the thymus and the heart, which affects the adrenals, which affects the pancreas, which produces a chain cascade of positive effects all the way down to the sexual organs. So when we tune in to these higher frequencies, we have to access to a different kind of light, a, a frequency faster than your visible light. And all of a sudden we are activating a greater intelligence within us. So now because the pineal gland is activated, Wow, now as the pineal gland is activated, we can pick up higher frequencies, which in turn produces a change in chemistry. And the higher the frequency we pick up, the more it alters our chemistry. So which means the more visual, hallucinogenic, and higher energy experiences we have. The crystals in our pineal gland acting like a cosmic antenna are the doorway to these higher vibrational patterns and realms of light and information. This is how we have internal experiences and are more real than our external ones. These pineal metabolites, okay, so these pineal metabolite chemicals your body produces fit into the same receptor sites as serotonin and melatonin, but they carry a very different chemical message from a realm beyond sensory-based material reality. As a result, the brain is now primed for a mystical experience, opening the door to other dimensions and moving from the individual from a space-time reality to a time-space reality. And since all frequency carries a message and that message is a change in chemistry, once the pineal gland gets activated and you start experiencing and processing these higher frequencies and energies and elevated levels of consciousness, they often present themselves as complex, changing geometric patterns, usually perceived in the mind's eye. And this is good. This is information. So when you have these mystical experiences because your nervous system is so coherent, it is able to tune into these super coherent messages. In the darkness of the void, the pineal gland becomes the vortex for these very organized patterns and packets of information. And as you place your attention on them, just like a kaleidoscope, they constantly change and evolve. The same way TV picks up frequencies and turns them into pictures on the screen, the pineal gland chemically transduces higher frequencies into vivid surreal images. So in graphic 13, in the color insert, you can see some of these geometric patterns which are called divine or sacred geometry. So such patterns have been around for thousands of years. And in chapter eight, I mentioned that these patterns appear to look like ancient mandalas. Their energy and information in the form of frequency. And if you can surrender to them, your brain via the pineal gland will transduce these forms, messages, and information into vivid pictures and imagery or lucid experiences. So the best thing to do is when you see or experience these is just to let go and surrender. The best thing to do when you see or experience these patterns is to surrender to them and not try to make anything happen. Just be the awareness of it. These patterns and forms usually do not appear as two-dimensional or static. Instead, they are alive, have depth and compromise, mathematical and very coherent fractal patterns, never ending and complex. So another way to see this is through the concept of cymatics, derived from the Greek word of wave. So it's derived from the Greek word for wave. Cymatics are a phenomenon based on vibration or frequency. Here is a way to picture them. Imagine if you took the cover off of an old speaker box and laid it flat 
If you filled that speaker with fluid, shined a light on it, and began playing classical music up through it, the frequency and vibration of the music could eventually create coherent sounding waves. So these waves would interfere with each other and eventually create geometric patterns within patterns within patterns. And as with a kaleidoscope, you would see these evolving geometrical arrangements become more highly organized. And the difference between these images in the kaleidoscope and the cymatics is that the images in the kaleidoscope, yeah, in the kaleidoscope appear two-dimensional. Geometric patterns such as cymatics, however, appear to be alive and are three-dimensional. Wow, or even multi-dimensional. Okay, so in addition to water, the vibrational effects of cymatics are translatable to sand and air. In other words, these three dimension or these three mediums pick up vibration and frequency and turn them into coherent geometric patterns. Wow, so if you search, you can find several videos. So yeah, if you search, you can find several videos showing this on YouTube. So when your pineal gland picks up information, it's picking up these same types of waves in the environment around you. So these coherent, highly organized standing waves that exist beyond the visible light spectrum are constantly being consolidated into packets of information and transduced into images, wow. So they're consolidated into packets of information and transduced into images by your pineal gland. They are just patterns of information that are intersecting in a very coherent way. And when you put your awareness, they change and evolve to become increasingly more fractal, intricate, beautiful, and divine. It's all information. And just like a transducer, your pineal gland takes that information and descrambles it into imagery. This is one of the reasons why I decided to use Kaleidoscope as a tool in our advanced events to train students. So it's to train students brains to be disarmed when they experience this more complex behavior and imagery, as well as to more easily recognize and open up to receiving this type of information, period. I'm going to stop here because one of the things is that, you know, when you first have these encounters, you don't know that those are packets of information. I didn't know for a long time. I remember seeing all sorts of geometrical patterns before, but I didn't know. I just was amused by the movement of the energy and the colors, but I didn't know what it meant. It wasn't until I went to Cancun and heard Dr. Joe, and he's the one who enlightened me and um, revealed to me that that's a packet of information. And if you continue, if you don't try to look at it and you just stay, stay in that same state of awareness, and you just allow, just allow whatever to be to be, then that packet of information can then download and then your trans, your, your, basically your pineal gland is going to transmute that information into information and imagery and word pictures and so forth that you can understand. So once your pineal gland picks up the imagery, fasten your seatbelt because things are going to get exciting. You might come out of your body and travel down a tunnel of light, down a tunnel of light, or you enter your body and might come filled with light. So you might come out of your body and travel down a tunnel of light, or your entire body might become filled with light. You might even feel like you've become the entire universe. And when you're looking down at your body, even find yourself wondering how you're going to get back into it. So when you start having these very profound unknown experiences, you can contract in fear, which means to grow smaller because it's the known or the unknown rather, and trust because it's the unknown. The more you surrender and trust, the deeper and more profound your experiences become. And because this experience is so profound, you're not going to want to rouse yourself back to wakefulness, thereby changing your brain. The more you surrender and trust, and the deeper and more profound your experiences become. And because this experience is so profound, you're not going to want to rouse yourself back to wakefulness. Therefore, changing your brain waves back to beta. Instead, this is the time to surrender, relax, and go even deeper into this transcendental state of consciousness. In this moment, you are not sleeping. You are not awake. You are not dreaming. You are transcendent of this reality. 
If your brain chemistry is right, the body will be totally and completely sedated. This is what we are training for, to experience greater levels of wholeness, oneness love, and higher consciousness. But there's more. We're going to stop here, because this video is started at 9, and it's 11.25. So we're going to break this into a, we'll get part two in a separate video. Thank you for tuning in, tapping in, and turning on today to chapter 12, part one. Tomorrow we will do chapter 12, part two. I'm Dame Lillian Walker, your host for 11 Money Secrets TV. Thank you for joining me tonight. Ciao for now.